Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 37. I'm Fred Green. A few episodes ago, we met Lynn Marriott from Vision 54. Today, we'll meet her teaching partner, Pia Nelson, in an episode we call Every Shot Must Have a Purpose. Now, here's a couple of nuggets from Pia's Wikipedia page that will put her expertise in perspective. She played on the Swedish national amateur golf team from 74 to 81, appearing twice in the World Amateur Team Championship in 1976 and 1980, and she won the European Ladies Team Championship in 1981. She played on the LPGA Tour from 1983 to 1987, and she was the head coach of the Swedish national women's teams from 1990 to 1995, and the head coach for the Swedish national men's pro, amateur, and junior teams from 1996 to 1998, and was the captain of the 1998 European Solheim Cup team. She coaches a number of LPGA Tour professionals and is the coach and mentor of Annika Sorenstam. Enough said, right? Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, where you can buy used golf balls at a fraction of the cost of brand new ones. Now, when you buy from TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, you'll get guy, uh, balls that, that have been hand-inspected and sanitized, and then they grade them for quality. And now there's three different categories you can choose from on those grades, which are Eagle, Birdie, and Par. Now, if you're interested in getting a ball that compares to a brand new ball fresh out of the sleeve, well, then you want to order the Eagle quality balls. I highly recommend it because you're going to get a, practically a brand new ball, but you're not going to pay the same price as you would for a new one. And these are not X-outs. These are not refurbished. These are not practice balls. They may have a logo on them, and they may even have somebody's markings on them that, you know, like we all do, we put markings on our ball to identify the ball. But that's because these guys hit the ball once and it ended up in the dirt and no one found it until our guys did. So take advantage of the Eagle, Eagle quality premium used golf balls at nearly half the cost of a brand new box from our friends at two guys with golf com. And remember that golf smarter and golf smarter mulligans listeners get an additional 10% off every order every time with a coupon code golf smarter. That's two guys with golf com, And that discount offer expires on April 1, 2020. Welcome, Pia. Thank you very much, Fred. How are you? Very good. Well, thank you for spending the time with us today. I'm looking forward to this conversation because I loved talking to Lynn, and there's so much more that I want to cover that hopefully you can uh, share some light on for us. Uh, your new book is called The Game Before the Game, The Perfect 30-Minute Practice, but it's a follow-up to your first book called Every Shot Must Have a Purpose. Yeah. What's the big difference between the two books? Well, the Every Shot Must Have a Purpose book is even more focused on playing the game and different tools you can learn to be managing yourself better on the golf course and enjoy your time more on the golf course. And then the second book goes more into practice and how to prepare the way we see the game. I see. So let's flesh that out a little bit. Let's talk about um, every shot must have a purpose. Now, obviously... Uh, I think that every shot has a goal. I want to get it to a specific place. Yeah. Um, and I even get to the point where sometimes I, I consider my next shot before I even take this one. I know. That's, I mean, that's a, for some reason, golf gets it so easily in the future. The next shot, you know, oh, I have the best run going ever. Am I going to be able to do it? Or, oh, there's some tough holes coming up. Or some go a lot to the past, like, why did I miss that putt? Or, oh, I'm like three under par. And then we go future, past, future, past, but we know the best performance we do in the present. So, so many golfers need help to get back there. Right. And when I'm talking about the, the next shot, I'm not thinking about my scoring necessarily. I'm thinking more about positioning. It's like uh, I've got a, a target for this shot so that I can put myself in good position. Yeah, for the and second shot. Exactly. So that's that's a beautiful way. And I, I know when Annika speaks about this, Annika Sorenstam, she always, always says that, you know, first you go to the future where you want to hit the, sh the shot and 
the ball flight, and then you come back to the present. So that's a good way of using the future, but then you need to make sure and come back and get the job done, too. And really, that is the key, is coming back. Yeah, exactly. And be totally... Because what we know about peak performance, and it's nothing Lynn and I have made up, it's been the same through the history of times, that absolutely peak performance, we know we're in the state of being present, and we know whatever we're aware of is sensory-based. And in golf, we know that, that some are over the shot, seeing the shot or the ball flight, or others are just feeling something in their hands or their body. So it's a lot helping the, the players that you know plan for the shot and then come back in some kind of sensation that really works for you. Right. And now let, let's talk about, uh, as opposed to every shot has a goal, but every shot has a purpose. Can you Let's flush that out and talk about how we should take that out on the course with us. Yeah, one exercise that we like to do with our players is that we go out in the golf course and um, and just check, like, this every shot has a purpose and every shot needs a decision and commitment to it. We have them, before they step up to the ball, actually state the decision out loud and then uh, go up and hit it and then afterwards check up on how committed did they, did they stay to the, the decision they just made. And it's been amazing because so many have realized that you know, this every shot must have a purpose and must, must have a decision, must have a commitment. So many have never worked on that. I mean, we get tour players that realize they, they only do it maybe 40, 50 percent of the time. <laughs> and here they have these great looking technical swings, they're physically fit, but they haven't thought about that every shot needs to have that pure purpose. Oh, I can't tell you how many times where I'm standing behind the ball preparing for my shot, I'll make a decision what I want, what I want to do, and then I get over the ball, and for some reason everything changes, especially on putting when you feel yeah. like it looks different than it did over there, and then my head starts going. I, I guess that's it, it's not a, rare. No, and it's, and it's something, if you're newer into golf or you play golf a long time, it's something you can actually learn to do, and it's going to cut off strokes from your rounds right away. And this is like one area where Annika Sernstam, she just about every round she ever plays, she focuses on making clear decision and then having the courage to commit to it. And if she comes in after a round, having done that all the way around, she's usually happy no matter what the score says, because she knows if she doesn't do that, she's wasting away strokes. Right. It's interesting you use the word courage. Yeah. There's this courage. I you know, so many spend all this time in pre-shot routine, and usually way too much time, in, in my opinion. And then they get over the, the putt or the, the shot, and they, you know, like you say, they change your mind, or they get doubtful or hesitate, and it's, it's not a very good way of doing it. Would you advise that you spend more time behind the ball making your decision and then walking up to it and making the shot or because I have played with people who stand over the ball and we've seen Sergio do this stands over the ball for a long long time no I, we, we usually get to help a lot of golfers just make their routines and the time over the ball a lot more efficient and you know you should say you know, Annika Sernstam she usually spends like four to five seconds over the golf ball some other great players might be up to eight, nine, ten, but if it's more than that, and if you have a quick mind, it's so easy to have all these thoughts pop up. So, the least amount of time you need to spend over the ball, the better. And and for technical reasons too, not to get static and and stiff. So, so we we do a lot of practice on the golf course, helping the golfers, you know, do the thinking. Get clear, and uh, when you step over addressing the ball, it's just address the ball, get settled, and go. And be more of, of an athlete you know, when you step over the ball and you interact with the target. Yeah, like a clear key system. Yeah. But then the same thing is with the, what they do in the pre-shot routine. Or we often call it the think box. So many golfers do so much stuff, and they don't even know why they're doing it. <laughs> because a good golf is a lot about energy management, too. And if it takes you a minute or... 90 seconds to to hit each shot, it can get tiring during a round of golf. Sure. Now, it's interesting, you you mentioned think box, and my conversation with Lynn, she mentioned a play box. Yeah. Could, the play, play box is, after I made the decision and I start stepping into the golf ball, that's what we call the play box. 
Okay. So two distinct thought processes in two different areas. Your think yeah. box is you're behind the ball, you're, you're making your decision, and then you're saying commit to it, yeah. s- step into the play box, make the shot. Yeah, because the way the game is set up, we need two different states of mind. The think box is where we can be like intellectual and be strategic and plan and check details of the swing and wind. And, you know, it's, it's good to, to think there. But then having the discipline, to switch over to a state of, of peak performance that we know is more sensory based in the present. And most people today can't do that for more than a few seconds. So that, that's why it's good not to stay there longer. Please, I beg of you, can you give me some advice on how to keep your mind clear when you step into the think box? Yeah, or you mean step into the play box? I'm sorry, yeah. step into the play box. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, one thing is, one one is to make the time a lot shorter. <laughs> that that will help many. But then, then also that we say it's not an empty box, you need to replace it with something. Because if I just keep it kind of empty, it's so easy to start thinking about the swing tips and consequences of the shot. But if I, if I made a routine that I do all my preparation before, Okay, and then I start taking the steps in. So I aim and I line, connect with the target, but I already know that when I'm in there for a few seconds, for some places most, I mean, the most important thing is to see the ball fly, or for some other ones it's just to feel the weight on their feet, but they already know what other things to focus on. So you stay busy and engaged with that, then there's less chance to have the other thinking going on. Actually, in our new book, the, the, the game before the game, we have a whole chapter how to practice the play box. It's always amazed me when um, Tiger has been able to stop mid-swing. You know what? That is so remarkable. He, it really is. Because he's so, so trained and so skilled to be so aware and present to himself, so he can do that. I have never seen anyone be able to do that better than him. Oh, so uh, it's nice to know that even professionals' jaws drop when he can do that? Yeah, absolutely. I find it close to impossible to step away from the ball once, I, once I'm once i addressed it. Yeah. I mean, I can go, oh, wait, my feet, it's in a hole, you know, or, yeah. or I'm standing on a tee, an old tee or something. But yeah. I'll still stand there and make the shot, and I paid dearly for it. Yeah. Well, but, you know, but very often golfers do that, but they have never really considered that it affects their performance or that they need to practice more to have a, a routine, what we call the think box play box, that is really functional for them. And having played practice rounds where you really check up on how you're doing it and you can have the courage to, to um, back off if you feel you're not in the state you want to be in. Once again, you can't get sloppy about that, because then if you practice in a sloppy way, that's what you get good at. Right, right. And when you're in the think box, does that include a pre-shot routine, or is that all pre-shot routine, including the thinking, our, the swinging? Our think box is, is everything from it's like your time to hit the shot, so it's the whole, you know, getting ready to what club you're going to hit and what kind of ball flight, and then if you're doing, making practice swings or whatever things you're doing. Oh, so it can it could last a while. It's not just getting behind the ball. I mean, it could last a while, but you know, we don't think the whole think box play box for anyone needs to take more than an average of thirty seconds. Okay. You know, and it would be good for the survival of the game too, for for pace of play reasons too. Right, right. But there's so many people who spend so much time over the ball thinking about every move yeah. they need to make. Yeah. And that's is that a recipe for disaster? Well, it is. From anything we've ever studied and known about peak performance, it's it's not uh, functional. And we know that because players are over the ball being like in a have to do list in their brain, and you can never get in a peak performance state with to do list in your brain because you're one step removed from the experience. Exactly. But also, also to have a fluid, nice rhythmical. Swing, if you're standing still over the ball, it's really hard to get a smooth swing going. Hmm. And is there, um, when you do a post-shot routine, and I would love some advice on, on a, an effective post-shot routine, uh, are you going back into the think box, or is it a different box altogether? We actually, no, we actually we have a name, sometimes we call it the hero box, but that's, 
what 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 is important because very often the finish of the swing or the post shot, you know, mostly it's been talked about for etiquette reasons that we're not supposed to swear or throw clubs or for technical reasons to finish in balance. But there's so much more to it than that because. We know any human being, whatever we experience and it's emotional to us, positive or negative, it gets stored stronger in our brain as a memory. So for performance reasons, how we choose to react to shots is going to probably be the most important factor if you're ever going to be a confident golfer or not. Because so many play golf and they hit a good shot, they take it kind of for granted and stay neutral. So it doesn't get stored very strong as memory in the brain. But then they hit some bad shots and they get kind of upset internally or externally and it gets stored. <laughs> so they, so many golfers have this huge library of bad shots in the brain and they have a very tiny library of good shots. So, I mean, it works like from evolution of mankind just that for survival reasons. So that's why a kid putting a hand on a hot stove starts to cry, it's a good thing because it's emotional, it gets stored as memory. And then when we come to similar situation in the future, we can we get the warning sign like back off danger. So we every human being through the history of time we have this thing in our brain, but it also works on the golf course. So that's why post shop if we're going to play the best golf possible, it's good from the first day I ever play golf. I learn to either be neutral or happy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> neutral or happy? Yeah. Even if yeah, you're. Many golfers can have, like, they have certain holes they come up to and say, I hate this hole. Oh, absolutely. I can hate the golf hole. I mean, the only reason <laughs> you're doing it because you have some stored bad memory of it. Right. Well, it's, I hate this hole. I always put it in the bunker <laughs> no, here. I always put it in the water here. Yeah. Or some, you know, many tour golfers, they, they have certain courses they always play well at, and it's for the same reasons. It's like, oh, I have all these good memories flooding as soon as I get them to the parking lot. So we need to be careful with that because it certainly affects our future performance. Um, someone asked me recently uh, to see if I can put this question in when it is appropriate, and I think it is right here. When a pro is warming up for a tournament, and in, it's not a practice session, they're in their warm-up session, um, do they, like us, do they have days where there's just a club that's not working and they decide, you know what, I just... I'm going to avoid this club, or is that all mental thing that you become allergic to your five iron occasionally? Yeah. No, I mean, it happens to every professional golfer I've seen, and sometimes this, not even all the clubs in the bag don't work in warm-up. <laughs> but I mean, one That's thing, scary. Yeah, but one thing we need to remember, too, is all of us have had warm-ups where we hit the ball perfectly, and then we go on the golf course, and it's all gone. And the opposite, too that I just I don't can't hit my driver or I can't make any swings and then you go on the golf course with low expectations and you start playing great. So first of all not to equate the, what happens in warm up with how the day is gonna go. <laughs> but absolutely, I mean, I mean that's why we we need to, all of us need to learn when things go wrong and we talk about this in the book too, all of us have some tendencies. It's not like there can be thousands of things that go wrong. Most of us are very consistent how we get in our own way. And when we can start to recognize what those are, if it's warm-up or it's happening during the round, we know where to go. So for me, for example, the first thing, always that I, my tendency is that I get too quick. That my temper gets too quick. And it was like that when I started playing golf for very many years ago and it is still the same today and probably will be when I'm 90 playing golf so each person needs to know you know first of all how, what do I do when I play great golf but then when I do get my own way is it for some people is aiming others is grip pressure for me it's tempo and so you know to coach yourself that way it's really important to recognize what the worst part of your game is yeah, or, or, you know, or like in just nice words, my tendency is kind of how how I disturb the great game. You know, and everybody has it. It's just the ones that are honest enough and they know what they are, they can they can get out of the slumps a lot quicker than the ones who are 
these blind spots they have no clue what to do so they ask everybody for advice and they might get more and more messed up yeah oh advice on the golf course worst <laughs> thing in the world right yeah unless you're paying someone to do it yeah so we so that's like we you know all the golfers that come first we need to know the recipe how each one of us play great golf and then after that when when it's not great what normally happens right and knowing that it's only a few days during the year, things might be great. I like my swing. I like the course. My body feels good. My mind is where I want it to be. And most days for anyone, there's something that is not quite there. It might be something I'm worried about outside of golf or my back is bothering me or I have a funny you know, left to right curve on my drive. So whatever, something it's not quite there, and then it's the big trick. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> yeah, right. So lower expectations is really an important thing. Well, you know, I mean, there's two sides to it. I mean, we are the Vision 54 company, so we, we like to, you know, all of us need to look at our possibilities and, and see that. But then when you actually go out and play golf, you know, you can set your goals, you have your visions, but then when you actually step on the golf course to play, you need to lower the expectation and be present and get the job done for each shot. Yeah, I've always said if you uh, if you have no expectations, you can't be disappointed. Not at all. <laughs> oh. But you, you're right. Setting goals is a very different thing than lowering your expectations. Yeah. Yeah, of what you want to do. Uh, I, if you don't mind me asking, you've mentioned Annika a number of times. Can you please... Uh, Kind of fill me in on, on your relationship with Annika Sorenstam? Yeah, so I've had a very close relationship with her for how many years is it now? For like eight, 18 years. So, because when I first uh, started coaching back in Sweden, she, she was actually on the first team that I ever coached. So, since uh, 89, I've had a coaching relationship with her, and then, of course, she's become a very good friend as well. When did you realize that she could probably be the greatest golfer in, in women's golf? No, oh, it's funny. I mean, Annika and I would get laugh at that often because, you know, you, you don't know. Because with Annika, I was in a group of players, and I thought, like, all of them had all these potential and abilities. I probably thought more than they did themselves. But that Annika was going to become the, the greatest golfer, you know, best in the world when she was 18, 19, 20, no one... No one knew. I mean, she wasn't even recruited to the college she wanted to because they didn't think she was a winner. So she she was among the better ones, but it wasn't until she was around 20 that her motivation and drive started just getting stronger and stronger. And, you know, she's always been a hard worker, and anything she knew she could improve, she would just go and do and get done and never stop till she's got it. So I just kept seeing it happening. So when she was... On twenty one, twenty two, and I could see that something extraordinary could happen, but I still didn't know how good. So it's just been a, a journey, you know, that that's been happening. <laughs> so it wasn't probably till. And from your very close vantage point, what do you see as being the thing that sets Annika apart from the rest of the field? Well, I mean, a few things. It, it is it is this extremely deep drive for excellence that. I don't see, m many have it, but she has it so much stronger, which means she doesn't mind getting up early every day and do the work needed to be done because she actually loves it. And another thing is like a total honesty too. I mean, honesty in, about and wanted feedback about, okay, I'm going to do a few things, what is not good yet, how can I get better, and I'm going to go do it. So it's extremely simple habits, but they are very strong and, and no excuses. I mean, so many might want to get better, but then they have all kinds of excuses why they can't quite do things. She's, she she has just has not had it for all these years. And again, please, if you don't want me to ask these questions, I won't, but I'm just curious to work with somebody at that level. Are there things that you see that are ongoing bad habits that you try to work with her on, but they just get kind of tucked away and continue to happen? They, you're, the frustrations you have as a coach with somebody at that level. I know it, it's it's hard to tell because I mean Annika, of course, through her career, has always been things coming up. 
But she's actually one of them that if she decides on one thing, she actually gets it done. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I mean, she gets needs to be re-reminded the whole time, like everybody else, about about uh, you know how her post shots reactions and and. Um, you know, in, in, in one thing that is recurrent that all all golfers need to look at is, you know, to be really clear about your motivation, why you're doing it. And like every, every great golfer, you know, we want to have the extrinsic motivation of wanting to win a major or wanting to be number one, but we need to have that intrinsic, like, love, where, love about it is independent of the outcome. And that, she's had to reevaluate like all players should do throughout their career. Because when you're 20 years old, it's going to be different than when you're 25 and when you're 30 and 35. And now she's 37 this year, this in October. So she needs to reevaluate and check, check up again. What is it? You know, why do I want to keep doing this? So, so there are things that reoccurs the whole time, but it doesn't mean that she's not good at it or any other player, but they're it's like a journey. It's, it's, you can't say, that, okay, I got the play box and I don't ever need to work on that again. You need to check up on it all the time. Or post shot reactions, or practice habits, or you know, the goals, or any, anything that has to do with the performance. The skill level might be high, but it always needs to have checkups. I know you're living in Arizona now, uh, that's your base. Um, but you and Annika both come from a part of the world where you don't get to play golf 12 months a year. Yeah. And we're actually now in the Northern Hemisphere, because we do talk to people in, in Australia and beyond, um, that are just getting into their season. But we have so many people that write to me and say, I'm coming up to the off-season now, and I don't really know what to do about staying in shape. Uh, what What is the best thing to do? What are the best drills to have to maintain my um, strengths and work on my weaknesses during the off season. If you could spend a couple minutes, give us some tips on that. I'd really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We realize the off season can be a great advantage because we can do so many other things. But first is to make a really good evaluation. Of all the things that affects performance. It's you know the way we look at it is you know physical, your body, technical, your swing and shot making and club fitting and all of that. It's mental, all the things the brain helps us with. It's emotional, and it's social, too. Because some people like have big problems not playing with people that play slow or talk too much or their spouse annoys them on the golf course. or you know. So in all the different areas, do a really good evaluation. And then see, you know, for next season, what I really want to be better. And so much of that, you can play practice even though it's snow outside. But when it comes to the to the, the swing and uh, maybe being inside and practicing, you know, first of all, with with the swing teachers, you go through with the any technical swing changes that would be smart to do now during the winter time, and make a lot of swings at home in front of the mirror or watching television and 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 do that and get enough repetitions done to make it you know come a long ways with the change before the next season starts. But anyone, no matter what, can work on different exercises that has to do with balance, with with uh, checking the tension level in the golf swing, and uh, and different swing coordination exercises. You don't have to make swing changes, but there are many swing drills to do that helps anyone. So evaluate what, you're, what you want to improve in the off-season. Yeah, and, and, look, and, look, and look at it broader than... Just the golf swing, because one of the things Lynn and I always want to make clear, if we, if we don't play well, it's because it's a bad putting stroke or bad golf swing. But the cause of a bad putting stroke or bad golf swing, you know, it sometimes is technical, but it very often is mental or emotional or physical. It's just that it shows up in the golf swing. So, so everybody needs to be clear, where do I need to go? And I think for very many, it would be in the off season too do a physical evaluation because so many can't make the technical swings they want to because the bodies can't do it. <laughs> They're too weak or too immobile or something like that. So that's the perfect thing to do. Oh, fabulous advice. And then if you, if you uh, want to make 
swing changes uh, or changes in your physical part of your game, now's a good time to get in touch with a coach and, and work on it in the off season so that you can uh, get out and play golf in the next season. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and I would highly recommend anyone doing that to still check, do the physical assessment because we see time and time again so many golfers wanting this, this certain swing, but they've never checked if their body is capable of doing it. Mm. <laughs> so then it could be a lot of wasted practice the whole winter if, if you don't check up on that piece. Sure. And then if you're going to start an exercise program, uh, or you know, and that includes working on your core, strengthening your core, and working on your balance and coordination. Again, yeah. this is a great time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's such great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, you a couple books that you should definitely look out for. Uh, the new one is called "The Game Before the Game: The Perfect Thirty Minute Practice," and it's not just a practice. You guys go over a lot of different ways to practice, but. You think that 30 minutes is all that you really need to practice? You shouldn't be out there hitting balls for hours? Well, we, we, no, we don't say that, but if you only have 30 minutes, which many golfers only have, you can still do a lot with it. And if you have more, you just add more 30-minute sessions. So, But you can be if, extremely efficient in a 30-minute practice. Absolutely. So many practice, and they, they are not really present and focused. So it's better to have shorter time and be very engaged in and focused, and then take a break. Right, right. And the other book, of course, Every Shot Must Have a Purpose. We didn't really get to go into that as much, but uh, hopefully um, I'll get a chance to review that book, look at it, and then I'll want to talk to you guys again, uh, you and your partner, Lynn Marriott, uh, and we can talk about it further. Yeah. Great. And, of course, vision54.com is your website if you want to get more information about uh, both books and their teaching methods. Yes, so everything will be on that website. Great, great. Pia Nilsson, thank you so much for spending this time. I really appreciate uh, all the, your insight and your sharing and your honesty about your relationship with Annika. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fred. 